Hello everyone. Thank you for tuning into this session. My name is Jill Gross and I'm delighted to be able to share with you some initiatives on our campus that are close to my heart. I have a confession, however. I'm actually not in the country at the moment. So I prepared this presentation in advance and my wonderful colleagues, Leanne Fisher and Jennifer Kopsinski from the Center for Pedagogical Innovation at Brock have volunteered to facilitate it and any questions that might arise. Of course, I'd be thrilled to hear from any one of you via old fashioned technology such as email. So I've added that information here. I want to begin, though, by expressing my gratitude to Leanne and Jennifer for their generosity of spirit in helping me with this. And I also want to thank the folks listed on this slide. And of course, to all the helpers for the work that's being done this week to creatively make this online conference happen. Hopefully, by the end of our time today, you'll have some thoughts resonating about how various contemplative practices can contribute to creating positive resilience, which is, of course, the theme for our conference this week. So let's begin. The title of this session is Maze or Labyrinth, Reflections on Walking the Path. It seems to me that in our work as educational developers, we are frequently walking a number of paths, some unicursal, as in the labyrinth on your left, and some that are maze-like, confusing, potentially quite challenging, such as the one on your right. As I was reflecting on this session and the values that are important to me in this work, I thought we could use these two images as metaphors to frame the conversation. I have been fortunate to work with so many amazing people, not only in my own center at Brock, but also in the educational development community and the ISW community. They have acted as guides and mentors, laying down threads for me to follow, putting up signage to show the way, even rescuing me from a number of dead ends. These people have modeled so many different ways of approaching the work we do, so please don't think that I'm proposing there's only one path into this work. The, the metaphor of a labyrinth and a maze to frame this conversation, I think, opens up some possibilities. So let's unpack that a little more. Here in this chart, you see some fundamental differences between these two types of experiences. Have a read. I think for me, the last bullet is the most poignant. A maze gets you lost. In a labyrinth, the point is to find some understanding. If we think about these two entities as metaphors, let's ask this question. What aspects of educational development work are maze-like? And what aspects are labyrinth-like? I'll pause for a moment for you to think about that question. I think there are times in educational development work when we find ourselves in the maze, when there are multiple and perhaps competing demands for support, or when we find ourselves tasked with requests that perhaps do not square with our values. Sometimes we find ourselves running from the Minotaur, and other times perhaps we become the Minotaur. I know I do. And that's when engaging in mindfulness and contemplative practices can help navigate the journey. So what are contemplative practices? Well, any practice that fosters compassion, connection to others, deepening sense of the moral and civic aspect of education, any practice that creates an inquiry into the nature of the mind, personal meaning, creativity, and insight, and any practice that helps build focus and attention. Essentially, contemplative practices are any kind of mindfulness activity, such as meditation, yoga, journaling, drawing, music, poetry, even using reflective visual prompts. Barbizat and Bush outline a number of projects and assignments initiated by university professors to encourage students to make connections between their own lives and the material they are studying. They call this contemplative pedagogy. For the past five years at Brock University, we have had a contemplative community of practice on campus with the goal of introducing initiatives that potentially contribute to stress reduction, 
greater mental health, and work-life balance, not only for our students, but for ourselves as well. This visual drawn by my colleague, Julia Forsyth, shows the diverse activities we have engaged in, ranging from pedagogical walks and talks, to weekly yoga sessions, to full day retreats for faculty and staff at our local art gallery. Coming together to talk about how we can slow ourselves down, focus on what is important, dispel with feelings of impostorship, and show gratitude for one another is at the heart of these activities. I'm sure we've all heard the safety messages when flying and the instruction to put on our own oxygen mask first before assisting others. And I think that's good advice, and I think we all need to practice self-care, particularly in educational development work when we're supporting others. So faculty and staff who attend these retreats are appreciative of the community that is created and the opportunity to discuss ways to work towards greater work-life balance. We also explore specific strategies for assisting students in being more mindful, such as meditation activities. My colleague Paula Gardner regularly practices mindfulness breathing with her large first year class to great success. She also engaged in a scholarship of teaching and learning project funded from our center in which she asked students to report on the experience. She called it the mindfulness experiment. 83% of her students report feeling more focused in class and 93% wished other professors used mindfulness activities in their classes. I think there is so much more we can do on campus to assist all of us uh, to be more grounded, to be more mindful. I have also used meditation activities with my graduate student class in education, in which students were invited to spend the first few minutes of the class engaged in a short meditation called STOP. We did this for about three minutes at the beginning of each class. Students were given the option of coming a few minutes late and waiting until we were finished before entering the room, but only one person didn't participate. Students said that doing the simple breathing activity helped refocus them from what had been happening in their lives before class started, and one even chose to do research into mindfulness in education. If you're up to it, why don't we try that now? Let's listen to Dr. Goldstein walk us through a video of the stop practice. It only takes two minutes, and you might be surprised that you feel more relaxed at the end. Now let's do the stop practice. So just beginning to, once again, get comfortable in the position that you're in, almost as if you're just relaxing into this moment. Just stopping whatever you're doing. And just take a few deep breaths. And as you're taking these breaths, see if you can pay attention to the sensation of the breath coming in and the sensation of the breath going out as if this was the first time you've ever noticed this breath before. beginning to observe your experience right now in this moment. And the experience includes your body, your emotions, your thoughts. And so beginning with the body, noticing the positioning of this body right now. And gently scan the body to notice any sensations that are there. aware of any emotions that are present too. In this moment, if there's a sense of calm or restlessness or a neutral emotion of some kind. And being aware if the mind is able to focus in this moment, if it's here or if it's off distracted in the future or the past, gently guiding it back to this moment. by just proceeding. And as we proceed, we want to ask ourselves the question, what's most important right now to pay attention to? And whatever comes up in your mind, 
That's what you'll continue with. Okay, now let's continue. Okay, thanks for trying that. I know I feel better. So now I'm excited to tell you about a new initiative from our teaching center that's part of our focus on contemplative practices. We're building a labyrinth, an actual seven circuit labyrinth that will allow us to explore the teaching, learning and wellness possibilities of mindfully walking outside, either alone or in community. This photo is a seven circuit classical labyrinth, which is the one we're building at the university this spring. And we brought together a group of people from across the institution to explore the build and the ways in which the labyrinth can be accessed by students, by instructors, by staff, and by members of the Niagara community. Our group, called the Labyrinth Community, or TLC for short, which I thought was kind of cute, it has representatives from human resources, facilities management, student services, student wellness, the library, student unions, as well as faculty and staff from a number of different academic departments. This initiative brings these partners together to look at how we can use the labyrinth to support ourselves and our constituencies in various ways, various holistic ways. So how is this connected to teaching and learning? The labyrinth has been in use for hundreds of years in many countries and cultures, but it is experiencing a resurgence of interest in the last few decades. A number of universities and colleges in the US and in the UK have built labyrinths on their campuses for various secular purposes, including wellness initiatives and contemplative pedagogy. I highly recommend the book, Learning with the Labyrinth, Creating Reflective Space in Higher Education by Jan Sellers and Bernard Moss. Sellers writes, the labyrinth offers a place of deep reflection, of calm and contemplation, a wellspring for creativity, a place to connect with our deepest selves. This is the heart of higher education. This is what teaching and learning is about. The establishment of a seven circuit labyrinth at Brock is also a fitting symbol of our commitment to a pedagogy of place. Brock sits on a UNESCO biosphere and we are surrounded by beautiful forests and trails. A labyrinth walk will allow us to reflect on the history of our region and acknowledge the peoples whose lands we inhabit. I don't know if you've heard of this organization, but it's well worth checking out. The organization Mood Walks promotes outside walking as a key factor in mental health initiatives. But not everyone can access trails, and with a labyrinth walk, you can't get lost. There's only one way in and one way out. Actually, faculty at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, Ontario, have been collaborating to explore ways in which a labyrinth can be used as an integrated arts-based installation to promote the idea of sustainability. David Greenwood, Canada Research Chair in Environmental Education, claims that because labyrinths do not belong to any one religion or cultural group, they can serve as a meeting ground for people of various traditions. His quote sums it up nicely. A labyrinth is outdoor, experiential, environmental, arts-based, holistic, and community engaged. Best of all, it creates a public place on campus that will in itself be an expression of transformative pedagogy. When you have time, have a look at Greenwood's video about the use of the labyrinth at Lakehead University. Now, many institutions have invested in indoor canvas labyrinths. This photo is an 11 circuit medieval labyrinth, which has a different pattern than the classical one. Indoor labyrinths can also make a huge contribution to contemplative walking, though the experience of being in nature, I think, is more restorative. There is quite a bit of research on the meditative aspect of drawing labyrinths. Why don't you join me in trying to draw one? It's actually quite fun. Grab a blank piece of paper and a pen or a pencil, and we'll only need a minute to do this. So it's actually quite easy to create a labyrinth. 
by drawing a cross in the center or the lower third of your page and then adding brackets to each of the quadrants. This is called the seed pattern if you add four seeds in each of the corners. Then you can just connect your line to your bracket. Bracket connects to a seed. Seed connects to a bracket. Drawing labyrinths is a mindful activity in itself. In fact, a lot of people use finger labyrinths as a way of de-stressing. It's great between meetings. One more circuit. And we have a seven circuit classical labyrinth. Now you can take some time to run your index finger over the paths you have created. Yours will actually be oriented differently than this one. This one is a right branching path, while the one we drew together was left branching. Keep tracing the circuits as slowly as you like. In her article, Finger Labyrinth Research, Tracing a Path to Resilience, Concentration and Creativity, Nina Johnson of Thompson Rivers University undertook a scholarship of teaching and learning project to explore three ways in which contemplative practice using finger labyrinths might foster a deeper learning experience. Students who use the labyrinth for less than five minutes, two or three times per week, felt consistently less anxious and more focused, present, non-judgmental, and open to creative insights. She goes on to say that if we embrace the interdisciplinarity, rigor, holistic ethic, and long-sighted vision of scholarship of teaching and learning, contemplative pedagogy, and transformational learning, we open ourselves and our students to an unprecedented educational experience. And I think this is what excites me about building a labyrinth and being able to explore those possibilities. In fact, when it comes to my own teaching responsibilities, I'd rather have my students doing this than this. Of course, I recognize that instructional context can be complex, but if we're going to build positive resilience in our students, our communities, and ourselves, we need to develop more holistic and contemplative ways of approaching teaching and learning. This looks absolutely mindless. To sum up, I have shared with you the way in which contemplative practices in my own educational development work has contributed to my well-being and happiness, and I believe to others as well. In addition to our various programs and activities over the past five years, I hope the build of the Brock Labyrinth this spring will continue to bring partners together from across the institution and will send a message to the university community that being well in our work and in our studies matters. It is about continually reflecting, continuing to learn, celebrating what we have, and remembering what the purpose is of a good education. I began this session asking about the work of educational development and drawing upon the metaphors of maze and labyrinth. And I know sometimes the unknown of a maze can be exciting. But when I reflect on when I am happiest in my work and when I'm most successful, it's when I'm following my own path, still in the company of colleagues who are also working or walking towards a shared goal. No walls to hide behind, no dead ends, no competition to arrive first. It's inclusive. And I've been very fortunate to find myself in those inclusive communities, particularly the ISW community and the EDC community. Thank you. So to that end, I'd like to leave you with this quotation, and this is from the book uh, by Jan Sellers and Bernard Moss. The gift to us all that is the labyrinth is an invitation to seek a better, more humane way of being and doing, and of allowing the human spirit, however we conceive it, to infuse and enthuse our shared teaching and learning, so that what we seek to offer our students is ultimately life-enhancing. 
Thank you for joining me today on this journey. If you are interested in any of these resources that I've used here, I'd be happy to send you a full list. And now I'm hoping that you'll have some questions and some comments, and I really wish that I was there to hear them, but I will catch up uh, with my co-facilitators very soon and find out what you had to say. Um, also, I might add, that we're launching our labyrinth at Brock on May 7th, and you're all invited as special guests. Thanks again.